Hello, welcome to Vegan Reflections, a video cast where a couple of vegans discuss and reflect about issues related to veganism. I will always be one of those, and then every time will be a different guest, another vegan, and we'll always be discussing uh, articles that I have published uh, the month before in Vegan FDA. Uh, in the blog section, I often write on issues related to veganism or animals, long articles. I do also short articles, but the long articles every month will be four or five, and the guests will select two, and those are the ones we'll be reflecting upon in these conversations. And many of will be looking at veganism itself, so it's like looking to a mirror. That's also vegan reflections. Uh, the term also means that, that we look at veganism uh, in the mirror. Today is the first episode of this series, and we'll be discussing articles that were published in uh, November 2022. Uh, let's have a look at the, the ones that were published. We're going to talk about two of them. Here we are. If you go to the Vegan FTA website, there is a section here called blocks. And if you go into them, you will see several long articles. Uh, and in uh, November, let's find the ones we, October, October, no. November, we have Dr. Selene Rao, the vegan engineer, healing. Uh, the Breaking World, The Meaning of Animals and Veganism. Uh, and and we'll, not, we'll be discussing the articles related, to, which I've written. So these others are written by other people. The third one I've written, uh, Forcing Animals to Fight and Practical Veganism. From these four, the first guest will choose two. The first guest of the first episode of Vegan Reflections will be Jamie Woodhouse, who runs this website, podcast, uh, YouTube channel called Sentientism, uh, which is a website based in evidence, reason, and compassion for all sentient beings. And we can see in, the, in his website that is all about evidence and reality. Uh, is all there is, reason, it works, and it's all we have, and moral consideration for all sentient beings, they experience moral harm or benefit before veganism as well. It's veganism plus science. And it also has a YouTube channel with the same name, and it also has a podcast. He is defined as an advocate for evidence, reason, and compassion for all sentient things through the philosophy of sentientism, who, which is the one he's promoting. Well, hello. Uh, now we have our first guest. I'm so excited about this. Uh, this, uh, of course, uh, you might know him because if you've been in the world of thinking about philosophy, you might have come across Jimmy, Jimmy Woodhouse. Hi, how are you? Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm doing great, thank you. And it's an honor to be experimented on as uh, you uh, launch Vegan Reflections. Yeah, and it's an experiment. So this is going to be try and error and see how it works. Perhaps it's too long, perhaps it's too short. We'll learn from this. But uh, I knew it would be good to choose you because you do these sort of things. You do. You have uh, this website, Sentientism, has a YouTube uh, uh, channel as well called The Same Thing, and a podcast is all about this philosophical conversations with people, like-minded people often. Uh, we all both vegans, in, and therefore this is one of the, of the rules of this uh, new channel. Every conversation will be between two vegans. Uh, but you do kind of the same. So I thought, well, gonna, you know about this. You know how to do it. Uh, yeah. So uh, so let's start. So first of all, there were I, I gave you the option to choose between four blogs that I've written months before, and you've chosen two. Can you tell me which ones you chose? Yeah, so the first one I chose is your, uh, based on your interview with Dr. Salesh Rao. Um, and I chose that because... Uh, I've spoken to Salesh myself. He's been a guest on Sentientism, as have you. It's fascinating to talk to both of you. But when I talked to Salesh, one thing I found interesting is that in a way, our worldviews are quite different. Uh, he has a more religious and spiritual worldview. Mine is very naturalistic. Um, and he uh, has a very, what you might call an ecocentric or a very holist 
systemic uh, way of thinking about ethics, whereas mine is a bit more strictly focused on sentience, um, uh, hence my work on the idea of sentientism. But at the same time, even though our worldviews were very different, we seem to coalesce around a really powerful common agenda, particularly his aspiration to move us towards a vegan world. So yeah, different worldviews, but an enormous amount in common. So I thought it might be interesting to explore some of those similarities and differences. And the other and one, the second one. Yeah. And the second one I chose was your article talking about what the word animal means in the context of veganism. Because again, I think it's a, a sensitive topic for many vegans because it's almost treated in this sort of reified way that, you know, we respect the animal and we're deeply concerned with exploitation, suffering and death of animals. But sometimes we can hesitate to interrogate what that word really means. Is it just a taxonomic thing or is there some sort of deeper moral essence to it? So I really enjoyed your exploration of the different meanings of the word and I thought that might be interesting to dig into. Well, let, let's start with that one and then we'll move to the, to the interview with Dr. Rao later. Jamie has chosen the meaning of animal in veganism. I'm just going to read the introduction. Each article will have an introduction just to give you an idea. But I recommend that after I finish the introduction, you pause the video, go to the website, uh, and you will see a link at the end of this. Uh, read the entire article so you will know what we'll be discussing about. But I'm going to read you the introduction. The zoologist Jordi Casamijana explains the different meanings of the term animal in the context of veganism and in all its dimensions. I am a zoologist. Therefore, I should know what an animal is. A zoology is the discipline in, within biology that studies animals. But whether scientists have agreed about what it means is less important than what other, others think it means because the word animal is commonly used by everyone, by everyone else everywhere in the world. This is not trivial. Sometimes how people interpret this word is a matter of life and death. You might be publicly executed by being deemed an animal or forced to work, kept captive, or even kill and eat them. There might be several legal definitions of what an animal is. There might be several cultural definitions, colloquial definitions, and even scientific definitions. For vegans, though, knowing what an animal is would be quite crucial, essential, I would say. This is because it is the key word in the official definition of veganism of the vegan society, which coined the term vegan, which is Veganism is a philosophy and a way of living which seeks to exclude, as far as practical and possible, all form of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, and any other purpose, and by extension promotes the development and use of animal-free alternatives for the benefit of animals, humans, and environment. In dietary terms, it denotes the practice of disposing with all products derived wholly or partially from animals. If we don't agree on what an animal is, how can we vegan seek to avoid all forms of animal exploitation and dispense all products derived wholly or partially from animals? You might be vegan yourself and think you know for certain what an animal is. You might have been vegan for decades and be sure you know how all vegans interpret what the word animal means in the above definition. Well, I would not be that sure. In fact, there are many different interpretations of the word, many of which fit within the definition of veganism because they are approached from the five different dimensions that veganism has. The term animal may take slightly different connotations if you are vegan who entered, who entered what I call the vegan mansion through the gateway of animal rights, the gateway of environment, the gateway of health, the gateway of social justice, justice or the gateway of spirituality. Perhaps it may be worth looking at these equally valid interpretations of animal within veganism. This is the introduction and then I go to talk to about the English mass with the word animal, then about the animal in the animal rights veganism, one of the dimensions, then the animal in eco-veganism, the second, 
the animal in health veganism, the third, the animal is in spiritual veganism, the fourth, the animal in social justice veganism, the fifth, and the last chapter is uh, veganizing away from the all binary view. So that would be the first article. Uh, the, the, as you've seen in the way I structured this one, one of the reasons I created this uh, concept of, of vegan reflections is the idea that many of my articles are looking in at the vegan movement. So they are not just telling non-vegans what they should do. It's, it's looking at our movement, where it is going, how it is evolving. It's big enough now to explore it and keep looking at it and keep being critical and, and, and see where it goes and see, raise the alarm if it goes somewhere, it should not be going, things like that. So that is like looking at the mirror. That's hence the reflection part of the word, vegan reflection. A part of just being reflected about ideas that come from, from this. And, and many of, of these articles I write, I use this idea of veganism having these five dimensions, also call it the five gateways into the vegan mansion. I like this idea of vegan mansion as a big home where everybody can live in. Uh, and, uh, and this particular article, the animal one, is a structure very much on this because there has several chapters talking about how each of these dimensions look at the world of at the, at the world animal. Uh, but before we go into that, what is your view about these five dimensions? Do you think this right? Should be six, seven, eight, only two? How, <laughs> how do you get that? Uh, how do you see it? I, I really like the way you talk about who, those different dimensions and those gateways, because the counter would be that for me, veganism ultimately is about ethics and morality so you might say well why do we need different gateways you know there's one true path you know it's the ethical path that's all we need and everything else is detail um and i feel the pull of that but the reason i like your idea of gateways is because it's much more open than that and it does recognize there are many different routes that people come into this movement and this philosophy and whichever gateway you come into the implication in your work is that you need to explore the whole mansion and understand all those different dimensions so i really like that uh it's a welcoming approach that means whatever brings you in you know it's great to have you here now let's explore together and and then also might give us a a richer view of what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I like the way you've described it. Cool. And you see that the, the first part of the article talks about my initial confusion when I first arrived to this country uh, with the word animal and yeah. realizing that people were using it meaning many different things that I never meant uh, from the language I have spoken it was a very clear one on the meaning while in English seemed to be have many meanings. Have you experienced this? Have you had situations where you were talking about animals and people were actually meaning something else or the other way around. Yeah, absolutely. So some people will use it in a taxonomic sense, a sort of scientific biological sense. Most people, it's a much more um, generic phrase that people haven't really dug into. You know, they just use it in a casual way, but that can lead them down many paths. It can lead them to think of only non-human animals. It can only lead them to only think about certain you know, subclasses of animals, you know, certain maybe simpler animals don't get counted as proper animals. Um, so yes, there's enormous variety. And you find that within the vegan movement itself as well, which is somewhat surprising because the concept is central to veganism. So you would think it's something that vegans are really good at interrogating and digging into and, and understanding. Um, but I think one of the things that happens is um, because the intuition around you know feeling a compassion for animals is so strong sometimes we're a bit nervous about working out what exactly that term means and we're particularly nervous about you know maybe there are edge cases that make us a little bit uncomfortable and so so that can lead some of us in the movement to sort of back away from examining these things too closely because you know we're a little bit worried about where it might lead or what difficult conversations it might it might lead us towards uh, but which, but I, which which is the definition you use? You, the one that you use when you say an animal, we, because yeah, you can have used many, but are you using the scientific definition? Are you using another one? Which one? Yeah, so I tend to go back to the, the scientific definition. And again, mm. as a zoologist, you can correct me, but I, you laid out you know, what those characteristics are. Mm. And it's a subset of, I guess, our evolutionary tree that includes of 
massive variety of different organisms. I think humans are a type of animal, hence the use of the term non-human animal, to be clear. Um, as you also hinted at, many vegans need reminding that we need to show compassion to our fellow human animals as well, despite our terrible track record. So I, you know, I think of it in that very inclusive sense. Um, so yeah, I will tend to go back to the sort of biological taxonomical definition. But at the same time, while I think it's a really useful shorthand because it's generally reasonably well understood, you know, well understood enough for us to use it in common parlance. Um, it's not the core of my ethical worldview. So the reason I care about animals isn't because of a taxonomy they've fallen into. It's, I mean, ultimately it is because of their sentience that that's why I care. Right, because uh, as I point out in the article, being an animal being sentient are not the same thing, but by almost a coincidence in this planet at this particular time, they are almost equivalent because we can't, we could not find anybody else other than an animal that is sentient, although it's easy to accept, and I'm convinced that sentience exists in other planets, just probabilistically. It's so unlikely that we are the only planet where life evolved into sentience. So yeah. life seems to be easy to evolve, although we haven't found it. That's not because it's difficult. It's just because we isolated in the middle of nowhere and the first life might be so far away that we will never find it but the universe is so big that it is bound to be there and if it's life there is likely to evolve into sentience but in this planet we do have uh an equivalent that all sentient beings we know are animals but as i say in the article not technically if we just follow the official definition of a zoologist of animal technically not all uh animals that recognize the sentience, almost all, 99.9%, which means almost all. But this is this group of the sponges, the periphera, uh, which are yeah. very primitive, uh, are the first version of an animal that appear, that they haven't developed a nervous system yet, and they're fixed, they don't move. And sentience, as I interpreted, meaning these three things that you have to have senses to perceive the world, you have to have a nervous system to process that information, to, to have an experience, and then use this experience to move in a way that makes you closer to the things you want and further away to the things you don't want. You need this movement and nervous system and, and senses that these periphery, these sponges don't have. And, and they are... They are uh, term differently so they are almost called proto animals uh, uh, in a way so they you you could you could say real animals are all sentience if you choose the proto animals are separate but it can is what I would you would expect in a world where life has evolved you will have these intermediate versions that not quite fit any definition before before and after but considering that uh yeah you could say on earth right now all sentient beings are animals but that might change. Now, do you think that the definition of veganism uh, from the vegan society, that says that we should exclude all animal exploitation and uh, uh, should be changed and replaced with animal for sentient being? It's difficult because the, the, the term animal is such common parlance and it's such an easy reference point. In a way, you'd be giving that up by switching to a reference to sentient beings instead. Um, so that's difficult. And as you say, there's such a strong overlap between the two concepts in practical terms, as far as our scientific understanding goes today, it seems, um, you know, it would, maybe it would seem odd to change it. But at the same time, I do quite like uh, the clarity of really focusing on the characteristic that gives a being moral salience for me, and that is sentience. So, I quite like the idea of being purist and referring to a compassion for sentient beings rather than compassion for animals. Um, one, just because it refers to the characteristic itself, whereas animal is a taxonomy, and whereas sentience, the capacity to suffer, to flourish, is ultimately the rationale for why I care about another. Um, so there's that precision question. Um, but as you say, it also does mean that we can be, it helps us be a bit more open-minded and scientific about some of the edge cases and some of the sci-fi scenarios, for example, where we do encounter uh, uh, you know, either potentially sentient aliens from elsewhere that have a completely independent taxonomy and evolutionary history to us, um, or we may even create ourselves in terms of artificially intelligent um, 
uh, entities that might come to be sentient in their own right. And so to my mind, you know, those those beings would not be classed as animals, so would be outside of the scope of the definition of a vegan moral concern. But if they, if we think they've got a good chance of actually experiencing things, we should care about them in just the same way as we do about a biological sentient animal. Um, so that's a long answer, but I, yeah, I would be quite tempted to change it just for that precision and clarity. I agree. And I, I actually think it's more likely that we develop sentient life uh, through artificial intelligence than that we find sentient life in our planet because there's technical difficulties of doing that, not because I don't think yeah. they exist. And I think it's not going to take that long. It's not that difficult from machines that we have now to reach to that level of, of self-awareness that it fits into the definition of sentience unless we feel uncomfortable about it and then we start changing the definition of sentience. I think we should, not that far away, less probably than 100 years, 100 years, we probably have sentient machines. And of course, then for the vegan world, that will be an interesting thing because the vegan world might say, well, we don't care because we have the word animal and the definition. So whatever other sentient means is good. Uh, that's fine. We don't change anything. But for sententism, which is what you represent, that will be quite a thing because you will have a completely different type of uh, creatures, entities, that you will start have uh, perhaps feeling some moral obligation to, to protect their rights that the vegans might not care, but you might care. Yeah. So have you explored this idea further uh, in, in your conversations with other people in the sense that are you prepared to be the sentientism philosophy be the only group of people in the world trying to defend the robot that everybody wants to kill? Well, uh, I have explored it. So I've spoken to people like Josh Gellers and Roman Yampolsky, who are academics who focus in uh, the area of robot rights and artificial intelligence ethics. Um, and in Josh's case, looks more broadly at environmental ethics and animal ethics as well. So I've had some fascinating conversations with people who are thinking seriously about those topics. Now, if you look at the most of the artificial intelligence field in general and robotics fields, one, there's clearly just a sort of commercial and a corporate and an innovative drive to just solve problems and do amazing things. So that's, I guess, the, the juggernaut that is driving most of the money and the development forward on that front. But there's a there's a very rapidly developing, probably not too rap, probably not developing rapidly enough, part of that field, which is focused on AI ethics and safety. But most of the people, nearly all of the people in that world, are concerned about the risks to us humans from powerful artificial intelligences. And that doesn't just mean, you know, super powerful. Uh, intelligences that will take over our planet and turn us all into slaves. But it also involves quite practical problems we're seeing in artificial intelligences now around bias towards racism, sexism, and so on. So there are very prosaic risks from artificial intelligence um, that we're experiencing day to day right now, long before we think any of these artificial intelligences are sentient. But there is a small group of people who are thinking, this isn't just about the risk to us humans, what about these artificial intelligences themselves, these robots themselves? You know, sh should we, and at what stage should we consider them as moral patients? Um, and it's an interesting space, which I think has an analogy with many people who think about environmental ethics and have an ecocentric way of thinking. Because one of my frustrations is that many of the people who are looking to go actually beyond uh, animal ethics into thinking about ecocentrism or thinking about robot rights and artificial intelligences seem to be more concerned about moral consideration for non-sentient environmental concepts or entities. And in the case of robot rights and AI, more concerned about the moral patiency of these technologies. Um, but they seem to have skipped over the vast quadrillions of very obviously sentient biological beings. So I share a frustration with many environmentalists and many people in the robot rights world because I think they're doing really important, interesting work, but they conveniently seem to have forgotten farmed animals, wild animals, and so on. So there's a big disconnect there. And one of the things that I'm trying to do with sentientism is to talk to people who are really thinking about the extent of our moral consideration and remind them of the urgent imperative of um, you know, the biological sentient animals we share this planet with and if we want to be ethically consistent, we can't think just about robot rights and just about the rights of nature if we're disregarding 
the rights and the ethical consideration for um, biological animals that we're harming at massive scale. But having said that, there's another even smaller group of people, um, and you might see work done by uh, the Sentience Institute, for example, and there's a, there's a few other organizations out there too, who are genuinely trying to take a sentientist stance. And they're saying, you know, we should care about sentience regardless of species, but we should also care about it regardless of substrate. So they're sort of in the same way as we're all fighting speciesism, they're also fighting substratism, which you might say is, you know, a, a, a discrimination based on the substrate that an entity runs on. So you might have a discrimination for biological entities, but against artificial ones. And they're saying, right. well, why should we feel that, right? If they're sentient, they, they all matter. So. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I, I talk about the eco-vegan interpretation of the word animal in my article, uh, which I, I, I feel they expanded beyond sentient meaning and animals into other living entities. Mm. Uh, but all, what I do with my idea of the vegan mansion and my idea of the dimensions is that these are not different worlds. These are parts of the same thing, dimensions of the same concept, rooms of the same mansion. Uh, that it's not healthy just to look at them in, in isolation because they will be always incomplete. Therefore, I, yeah. I subscribe to this idea that we should respect beyond sentience. Any, anything that can be killed, you should avoid it. If you can't, sometimes you can't. So, but that's not in expenses of my understanding of uh, the respect of animals. So the idea of me being an eco uh, vegan too, is not because I'm no longer an animal rights vegan, it's because I'm in addition to be an animal rights vegan, I'm an eco vegan. So I'm expanding it, uh, I'm not restricting it. And I think that is the problem you just mentioned, the, the people that you just described, they, they restrict it, they look one instead the other. They ignore one animals because they concentrate on others, when in fact they should just basically accumulate or expand and, and keep adding their considerations and their views to more and more creatures and entities. And then there is no danger. If you want to care about an object without sacrificing care about a sentient being, there's no danger for yeah. that. Uh, yeah. And therefore, that, that, they, for it, it, it's not in itself a bad thing to care about the object. It's the way that you might not care about the others, the inconsistencies in caring where it, where it seems to be the problem. And I, and I think that leads me to my, the last dimension, the social justice dimension I used in the book, in the article, is the, uh, the one that looks far beyond that and there's an, doesn't even put a label on it. It just says the other. Mm -hmm. So an animal is that other than when we feel superior in a supremacy society. Uh, uh, anybody else that is not us is equivalent to an animal. And that, and that definition of veganism works well if you replace animal for the other. And that the other means another race, another gender, another species, another whatever. And, and it still fits. And this idea that we should not harm anyone regardless to, to who they are, that seems to be the ultimate conclusion to, to, to expanding uh, this idea of Ahimso doing no harm. Um, but it also then matches perfectly well the type of vegans, and sometimes are called intersectionals, which spend a lot of time fighting for different causes, that like they don't find that is an incompatible thing to do. They find that reinforce each other. And it makes sense when you consider that they don't look about the victim, uh, I only want to help that victim, just look at the oppressor who oppresses indiscriminately to many type of victims regardless of their species. So how, how, how is your view about these interpretation of the word animal from the social justice point of view, meaning the other. I like it uh, very much. And it's because I think it comes back to a common moral grounding that I, I'm hoping everybody can agree on. So th there's all sorts of different types of morality and, and ethics, of course. Um, you know, there are nihilists, you might say nothing matters. There are relativists who say, um, as long as your group comes up with a set of rules there's no right or wrong it's just about social agreement um personally i disagree with both of those because i think both of them open up a route to uh terrible harm <laughs> but but if we put those things to one side and we also put to one side a sort of supernatural divine command theory ethic which ultimately says right and wrong is defined by obedience or submission to a deity or following certain rules it's not really about compassion for others it's about obedience 
if we put those to one side, and I think we should, um, what I think we're left with in just any common sense view of morality is that it's 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 about whether and how we care about the other. Um, and I think that's something that's deeply understood by most humans intuitively, right? Um, being a good person is largely defined by how and whether we care about others and caring about others is a good thing. And, and when we say we're caring about the other, what I think we, we're saying is that we are trying to always imperfectly understand how that other lives their life, what they perceive, what they want, what they don't want, what feels good to them, what feels bad to them. And we're trying to value that in the same way as they do. And we'll never do that perfectly. We'll never understand perfectly, but we're at least making that honest attempt to try and take their perspective, stand in their shoes and advocate for making things better for them, or at least not making them worse. And I think that impetus runs through, as you said, you know, all social justice movements. It's, it's basically, we feel compassion for the other. If they, if they are being oppressed, that individual is being oppressed, that group is being oppressed. We want to advocate to end that oppression and to free those individuals and to help them have happier lives. And I think that plays directly across to uh, the non-human animal space, because it's exactly the same logic. You know, if a morality is about whether and how we care about others, and for me, an other is any being that has their own perspective for whom their lives can go well or badly. As soon as you fit that criteria, which is a sentient being, you qualify as an other. And therefore, a common sense application of any social justice concept, any resistance to oppression, any well-grounded morality means we would, at the very least, not needlessly harm, kill or exploit you. Um, so in that sense, I love the idea of the other because I do think in a sense, every sentient being qualifies as, a, as another. And maybe more contentiously, I'd argue that I'm not sure an entity that isn't sentient really counts as another. We might care about them instrumentally. You know, I care about the ecosystem and plants and rocks and rivers and trees because of their rich impact and the quadrillions of sentient beings that suffer and flourish because of those environments and because of those systems. But I'm not sure... Uh, you know, this mug on my desk or a plant outside in the garden or a river really is an other in that ethical sense. They might be important for other reasons. And I sort of I like that eco vegan stance you talk about. But for me, that compassion is or my caring about those things is more instrumental, whereas my compassion and my social justice drive is for others and their perspectives. And therefore, they have to have a perspective. They have to be sentient to qualify. Yeah, I like this idea, this term pers perspective, because yeah, it fits clearly into the sentence idea that you need to have an experience from the senses and the nervous system you have that give you a perspective. <laughs> There's no other way to, to look at it because we have a world where we receive a stimuli, but different animals have different ways to perceive the stimuli. The world is the same, the stimuli is the same, but the perception is the same, the experience is the same, therefore the perspective is different. So, yeah. uh, right. I let, agree. Let, and, I'd, and, I'd, and I'd echo what you were hinting at earlier on, which is that um, ultimately, and people have different ways of thinking about what sentience and consciousness are, and sentientism itself is quite neutral on philosophy of mind. So, uh, you know, there are panpsychists who ultimately think that maybe almost everything is conscious in some way there are people who think that consciousness phenomenal consciousness might even be some form of illusion um there are people like me who have a much more sort of functionalist evolutionary based approach because i simply think that consciousness and sentience are an evolved class of information processing that developed probably in the cambrian a long long time ago because it proved useful to have an entity go towards the good and away from the bad and that was the root of sentience and because the, those roots were so old in evolutionary terms that's why it covers pretty much the entire animal kingdom today um so you know if you have a different philosophy of mind that might take you in certain different directions but whether you think consciousness is an illusion or is all pervasive in the universe or you have a more sort of functional materialist approach like me if you stick a fork in the back of your hand it still hurts right and that perspective matters you know whatever your philosophy might be so that's the sort of common sense grounding i try and draw people back to whatever it is and whoever it has it sentience matters oh 
Okay, let's change uh, article. Let's talk about the next one. Dr. Rao, the vegan engineer healing the breaking world. I will read the introduction. Jordi Kazibjana, the author of the book Ethical Vegan, interviews Dr. Sailish Rao, a system engineer trying to heal the planet and build uh, the vegan world. Given enough time, all things break. Energy pumping stars will stop working and either faint or explode. Planes will stop flying and end up in scrap yards. Computers will stop processing and will be abandoned in forgotten storage and even hearts will stop beating and bodies will return to dust. In this place we live, which we call our universe, there is a fundamental principle of physics, the second law of thermodynamics, which essentially tell us that with time, things will break. This law states that the disorder of the universe called entropy always increases with time. Well, but does this mean, uh, sorry, but this does not mean that chaos always prevails at the local level because when something breaks, it can be repaired. We can use energy and effort to repair broken things and mend failing systems. We can make them uh, last for a long time, but we need to know how to do it effectively. Luckily, some people know how, uh, how to do it. They are experts in finding out why things do not work anywhere. They are experts in repairing broken things, and they are experts in building new things with the pieces of discarded broken things. We call them engineers, and we find them everywhere. Some are very good at mending broken mechanical objects, others with electronic devices, others with pipes and tubes transporting liquids and gases. Others, though, can mend anything because they do not specialize in anything in particular. We call these system engineers, but we could call them engineers of complex stuff. Planet Earth is like a big machine with many components. A biological machine running on top of a geological machine running inside an astronomical machine. We humans have been playing with it so intensively in the last couple of million years that we are beginning to break it. Not surprisingly, because we are destroying many of its biological pieces, biodiversity loss. The places where pieces are connected to each other, ecosystem collapse. And we are messing with the energy that makes everything work, climate change. If we could uh, call clever engineers to repair the damage we have made, right? If we only knew any system engineers willing to work on the earth environmental, environment and find a way to mend our planet before it breaks down completely, right? Well, I know at least one. I know a human earth animal liberation activist that happens to be a system engineer that has been working on healing the planet for, the few, for, for a few years now. And he's an expert system engineer who has worked on very big projects, so big that the chances are that you are reading this thanks to one of the things he built a few decades ago. Dr. Salish Rao is a system engineer from India who, after immigrating to the US and becoming part of the Intel team, worked in, on the internet communication infrastructure for 20 years. During this period, he led the transformation of early analog internet connections to more robust digital connections that also run 10 times faster. The device you are using right now to read this is probably working with an infrastructure he developed. He received five exceptional contribution awards from AT&T Bell Laboratories between 1985 and 1991, a distinguished member of the Technical Staff Award in 1990, the Intel Principal Engineer Award in 2003, and the IIT Madras Distinguished Alumnus a word in 2013 for his technical contribution. He is the author of 22 peer-reviewed technical papers, 50 standards contributions, 10 US paid patents, and three Canadian patents. He was the co-founder of Silicon Design Experts in 1991, 
which was acquired by Level One Communications in 1996 and was later acquired by Intel Corporation in 1991 for $2.2 billion. A top level system engineers indeed. However, one day he left the expanding internet system to work on another system, one that seems to struggle. He decided to work on the Earth system, a system that we are breaking up and urgently needs repairing. He examined it, he found out what was wrong with it. He found a way to repair it and he talked to others about how to do it. And how is it that I know him? Because his solution is the vegan world many of us dream about. I had to interview him and find out more. It was truly fascinating. And then the interview begins. The first chapter is about changing countries and systems. Then Dr. Rao's vegan journey, how he became vegan. Climate Healers, the organization he created. The thermostat species of the planet, what he thinks humanity is. The Pink Promise, his relationship with his granddaughter. The VCOP and the World Food Healers Day, the current projects he's running. The first vegan university, a future idea he developed. And this is the article. I remind you of the title, uh, Dr. Salish Rao, the vegan engineer healing the breaking world. Uh, now, the well, reason I chose that title is because I never occurred, never occurred to me that system engineers might be the right people to yeah. ask the right questions when we have very complex problems like climate crisis that we live and even the whole animal exploitation element and, and this collapse of civilization as if we know it. So, and I realized if I had to choose, who I, would I choose? A, a priest, a, a politician, an academic, uh, all these have many agendas and they might have a very particular reason why they see the world where they, the way they see it. Even entrepreneurs and things like that, they want money, the academics, academics want status. The, but the system engineer's only objective is to solve the problem you present to that engineer. So should that's, and it's also the difference between an engineer and a scientist. A scientist is driven by curiosity, want to know more, as engineer is driven, driven by solutions. There's no reason to be an engineer if there is no possibility of a solution and, 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 and a feasibility of a solution. So it seems more urgent mm -hmm. that we approach the problems we have now with people that are having solution in their mind than people like me that perhaps have philosophies that are very, very kind of abstract sometimes. So that's why I thought, well, he's one of them. <laughs> he's one of them that he decided to apply his system engineer's mind to the world. And the, the thing I love about it, I arrived to the same conclusion that many of us have, that the solution is the vegan world. So now, do, do you think that there is a, a, a role of system engineers that has been underplayed uh, in the vegan movement or in the general uh, climate movement? I do, I do. And I think his perspective is really valuable. Um, there's a sense, I think, that for some people, uh, there's such a focus on the animals, and you might say, from my perspective, the sentient beings, as the centre of our moral concern, that we forget the systems that you know all of us as sentient beings are part of. So that sort of super focus on the ethical stance can sometimes lead us to neglect the problems of systems generally. Um, so I think that can undermine the way we think about solutions and ways forward and also styles of advocacy as well. You know, the long, the ongoing debates about systemic change versus individual change versus institutional change versus politics. And I think we need that if we really want to be effective. And of course we do. We need that systems thinking there too. But I think it's also really important because many people who say they think in a systemic, holistic way I don't think are really applying a systems engineering approach. What actually is happening is it's a more sort of vague sense of the earth as Gaia. You know, I have this reverence for nature. Um, 
in some cases, if people have a religious worldview, this idea that God made a perfect planet and then the humans came and messed it up. So all we need to do is withdraw and then everything will be wonderful. So there's this sort of sense of the system. Um, but there's a there's a reification of that. Implying, you know, if humans just got out of the way, nature is intrinsically good that would solve all of our problems that I don't think really reflects a systems engineering perspective that is actually engaging with the reality of how those systems work as opposed to just backing away from them. And I, I also worry that for some of those people with that sort of very expansive way of thinking, it becomes an end in itself. So, you know, a human withdrawal, allow nature to continue, everything's fine. Whereas a sentientist stance, and I'd argue actually, you know, if a vegan stance grounded in an ethical concern for other sentient beings should also be open to the fact that, you know, nature isn't necessarily a um, Edenic happy place for many sentient beings and just a human withdrawal doesn't necessarily address the systemic problems we're facing. So, yeah, I like his approach of taking a very big holistic approach, but then applying that engineering mindset, but driven by a, an ethical concern, not just a, I want to fix this widget. It's, there's a there's a reason behind it all, which I think is well grounded, which is a compassionate one. Yeah, because I think he he's really at the edge of these two type of people that you just described. Because he is a system engineer, but he's a Hindu, and he kind of become distanced from his Hindu heritage, and then he reconnected through the uh, experience with his uh, granddaughter to uh, the ideas from or deeper ideas of that uh, religion uh, without really kind of getting lost completely into them. So somehow yeah. managing to still be the engineer that knows the world, knows about evolution, doesn't deny evolution or how things work, uh, but then having this idea of, uh, of uh, deities or, or universe with purpose and human beings have a purpose of being the thermostat of the planet, all these sort of things that many um, many people don't have this view of humanity. Uh, and yet not letting it to cloud his judgment in a way, using it to reinforce the, the compassion element of it. So, and that's, I think is valid because the idea of a system engineer, theoretically, it should not be a human being. <laughs> you can't have a system engineer with all the preoccupations and, and limitations of human beings, if, if he's going to have to be effective in finding the solution. But we don't have any options at the moment. We have to use human beings with the baggage, where they come from, uh, uh, which cultural bias would they have, which religious bias they have. And we just need to deal with this and minimize that bag the interference of that baggage, yeah. uh, trying to maximize the efficiency of the engineering mind. And I think he might be a good example of somebody that is is there. What would you view about that? I agree. I think he's, I, he's, for me, he feels like he's getting that balance, you know, in a much better place than some, because, um, you know, I, I do prefer a natural, a very naturalistic stance for understanding the world. So that's why I describe sentientism as being about evidence, reason, and compassion for all sentient beings. So in that sense, you know, I do prefer a naturalistic way of thinking over a supernatural way of thinking or a religious or a spiritual way of thinking. Um, but at the same time, common themes can run th through them. That sense of, you know, what is humanity's role, that sense of compassion. Um, and um, I think, again, that's one of the encouraging things about my conversation with Dr. Rao is how much we could still agree on, even though our worldviews are different very different and the challenges i see in many more supernatural or spiritual or religious worldviews um one you can see them in uh intrahuman ethics quite often because while most of those relig most religions do have this sense of compassion and the golden rule and these ideas about caring for others um which i think most religious people carry through their lives quite often that compassion is either conditional when you're following the rules and bad things can happen to you if you don't follow the rules, uh, or they can be constrained to certain in-groups. Um, that isn't just about within a religion and outside, but that can be structures within the religious society itself, and whether that's caste or sex discrimination or bigotry against other worldviews, there can be problems there too. Um, and they can also change our, na our the nature of our role with non-human animals and 
the ecosystem as a whole and you know the concept of uh, dominion over uh, the world and the fact that while God might be at the top of the hierarchy, humans are just underneath made in his image and of course it's always his image um, and then everything else is there for our purposes so there are re- i think real problem problematic themes that run through many supernatural ways of thinking but i think it's absolutely possible and i think celeste shows a great example of how you can put some put, put, the, put the difficult stuff to one side and just hold on to the good stuff which frankly is the bits i agree with anyway from a completely naturalistic stance which is universal compassion a recognition of systemic complexity and interrelations and connectedness and yeah again we can despite different worldviews come back to agreeing that you know at least one of the things we need is a vegan world even though i'm not sure that would be that's not all we need but it would certainly be an enormous step forward and do you think i mean he famously said that he wants to get a vegan world for 2026 or as a goal i mean obviously he knows that that's a a uh, strategic goal as a good uh, tactical way to get there as opposed to a certainty vision. Uh, but he approached it as an engineer. So you have a deadline. Yeah. Engineers do have a deadline. It doesn't matter if you don't leap, if you don't reach the deadline, a new one will be created afterwards. That's not the end of the job. The job doesn't depend on the deadline. The deadline is the motivator for the engineer to do the work. And I think that he he really looks at it as an engineer. The way he presents how he analyzes the problem, uh, says these are the axioms that are wrong. These are the new axioms that have to be replaced. So it, it deconstructs the issue in a simple way, which is still complex, but, but is simpler than many other ways I've seen, uh, because it kind of gets rid of all the unnecessary thoughts and, and ideas and looks at it as a machine that is not working and we need to repair. Uh, but do you think that part of the uh, interesting things that, uh, that makes him perhaps uh, not clashing with your views more, the fact that we're talking about India or East and West, and he mixed both because he's an Indian that worked and lived in the U and the US. And this idea, had he been from another religion <laughs> other than Hinduism, perhaps uh, he would it would be more difficult to, to marry properly the, the kind of technical engineering aspect of his vision and his interpretation, cosmological and mythological interpretation from it. So you think that helps that he's from an Eastern and Western uh, kind of merge? I think it definitely helps because the that concept of ahimsa essentially, you know, do no harm um, by itself implies a concern for beings that can be harmed, i.e. sentient beings. And that's an ancient concept that runs through, you know, much of Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism. And it, and let's not let's be clear, right? It doesn't run through those things cleanly and perfectly. Um, uh, not, not that there is any perfection, right? But there's still, even within those communities and cultures, widespread exploitation and needless harmony of non-human animals. Um, and one of the frustrating things is, while well, some uh, countries where those religions are prevalent become a little bit more secular, the default would be that their consumption of non-human animals would actually go up. Um, and I'd love to offset that by telling a naturalistic story about why we should have compassion for sentient beings too. But I think that concept of ahimsa really does make it uh, easier for there to be an overlap because while he and you, I think would go further than me in terms of our sort of moral scope of concern for living things and plants and ecosystems, the ahimsa idea still draws a very clear distinction about, you know, what types of things are subject to harm. I mean, even that can be fuzzy, you know, can, can you harm a, a plant in the same way as you can harm a pig? I would say, you might be able to damage a plant, but does it experience anything negative as a result? No, whereas the pig clearly does. So and maybe I'm backing away from the, this clarity, but there's still something important about suffering and, and causing harm that is make sure, I think, that we don't forget sentient beings as we go more broadly. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I am a fan of Ahimsa as a concept, which I think is not just because it's old and that gives give them credibility, just because it's simple. Uh, mm. Just don't do no harm. And yeah. it doesn't really tell you more. And now, whoever use it, then expand it into where and who. And each religion that has used it have qualified it. But the concept itself predates all, all those religions and becomes simpler, probably was 
becoming simpler with time. But but yeah, the Jains who probably uh, use it more intensively in their practice, they they do have a different degree of acceptance in a way what we would call sentism within different creatures. They they use the word sen- uh, well they call it senses. They say that creatures have different number of senses, and plants mm-hmm. have fewer senses than animals, and therefore animals have priority uh, in, in, in preventing harm. So in a way, they don't want to leave plants apart. Uh, so they just give them a, a less uh, number of senses, therefore it's less important. That's a way they dealt yeah. with it. So, and, that's a, and, that's a, and that's a remarkably, you know, um, you know, there are brilliant modern welfare science that is looking at what sentience is and how to assess it, and that's a difficult problem. But um, to have a concept like that so ancient that actually, you know, echoes some of the modern scientific thinking about different richnesses of sentience is, is um, really important and impactful. And it helps you also to um, have those discussions. If someone does have a more biocentric or ecocentric point of view, I think we can say that's great, but surely there's still a distinction between cutting a blade of grass and cutting a biological animal, right? because of that capacity to suffer because of those additional senses, whatever it is, right? So as long as we keep that in mind, I think that can mitigate some of the risks of a broader moral scope. But I, I, if you don't mind, there's one thing I wanted to go back to about what you said about Dr. Rao's systems engineering approach, because I think some people will say, look, a vegan world by 2026, that's crazy. We would just never get there. We've got no time. But one, one of the things I like about him setting that ambitious goal and taking the systems engineering approach is it is actually that easy, mm. right? It is that easy. And, and I think you could also apply that mode of thinking to the to climate change as well. You know, yes, there's some, you know, we need better carbon capture storage and there's a few things we might need to work on. But whether it's climate change or whether it's animal agriculture, we have the solutions already today. It's not yeah, really he's, a technical he, problem. He, said, it's, he says this word, he says, Feasibility, no problem. It's not a yeah. problem of feasibility. It's a problem of people following the system. Yeah, it's a problem of human psychology, yeah. social norms, and political will. And and if we wanted to do it, we could do it today. And of course, there would be a transition to manage. I don't want to hide that, right? Because there are people with l- livelihoods and cultures that are deeply embedded in these systems, and that will take time to transition away. But in the simple terms, it really is as simple as all of us just deciding to step away from this industry and eat plants instead. So I do like that. You know, I like I like that framing because, you know, it, there's almost this vicious circle where people will say these causes are so difficult because of the social norms and because of political will and because humans are hard to persuade and it takes too long. And that almost becomes an excuse for us not acting. Mm. So it becomes socially difficult because we've explained to ourselves that it's socially difficult. So we lose the ambition and we sort of give up before we've even tried. So for someone like Dr. Rao to say, I know it's politically difficult and it might be emotionally and socially difficult, but technically from an engineering standpoint, it's not that hard. It's really not that hard. So, Yeah, and what I like also of his story is his relationship with the granddaughter because I think in a way he has dramatized the essence uh, of the way to apply the solution, which is thinking- Pinky promise. Yeah, the pinky promise. Thinking in the next generation, the next next generation, not the next generation, the next one, (laughs) which is the granddaughter. So this grandfather granddaughter relationship being the uh, place where the conversation should be centered, uh, which is the Greta Thunberg idea that from everyone, we should not listen to Al Gore anymore. We should listen to Greta. Al Gore had the chance, got it wrong, uh, forgot, forgot the animals and forgot the, yeah. the animal agriculture. Greta didn't because she's younger. She's, uh, her, the world is more important to her than for all the people because she is going to leave her. She's going to live uh, uh, many more years in that world that we left her. Uh, and it is not in left, we didn't leave it in a very good condition. So therefore, I think uh, the fact that he f- uses his granddaughter to push him into action is inspiring. Uh, and it also kind of tells you that's, 
uh, everybody should be listened. Uh, uh, this problem is a generational issue uh, and the solution will become when the, the young and the old got together and talk. I like that. So what do you think about this? Yeah, I do. I think it's really powerful. And one of the things I, I, I volunteer giving talks in schools about different aspects of philosophy. Um, and I find that all the time, whether it's six-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds. I was just this morning, I was speaking with um, some in the UK year 11s um, who are just coming up to their GCSEs, a sort of major educational stage. Um, but the questions that come from them have a clarity and a directness that you rarely find in a adult population um they're they're connected with the issues they see the implications they feel the responsibility and they can cut through some of the you know ethical and moral uh bullshit i think with a clarity that can be really forceful and i do think that this idea of you know imagining what future generations will think of us when they look back just as we look back on previous generations and say how could you think that how could you do that um, is a really important lens, not just because of the guilt and shame it might bring forward, but because of the hope it can give us about how, why can't we play a more positive role? You know, wouldn't we want to be seen as the people who are driving the next generation of change and social justice? Wouldn't we want to be making a positive change? Um, whereas there seems to be this odd middle ground where, you know, many public intellectuals are quite happy to pontificate about, oh, yes, I'm sure future generations will um, condemn us for uh, animal agriculture and then they almost seem to use that as an excuse to continue purchasing from it i just don't understand how you can make that connection between yes in the future we'll be criticized for what we're doing today but not criticize it yourself in the sense that drives you to change it's again humans are very weird but we'll find almost any possible excuse we can not to change and that imperative from you know our kids and our grandkids and their kids and their grandkids hopefully might kick a few more people into shifting the role humanity can play here. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also this idea that uh, they need us. The, the, the young generation, it's not that we're going to go away and they will solve it because they will have to if their world is not long our world. They still need us right now. And the knowledge yeah. we have, we have to pass it to the right people at the right time so they can use it efficiently as opposed to having to learn from zero and start from scratch. There's a lot of information we already know that can be used to build the vegan world. And this information is there, so let's spread it but and give it to the right people, not just the decision makers who are now, you know, res, res, they don't want to listen and they busy trying to get reelected and doing other things and getting money, but especially the future decision makers, the ones that you know will grow into new politicians and new business people. Uh, but they will have to use what we have. They can't just uh, conjure solutions from the air. And we have enough. As the, that's the engineering simple answer that you mentioned earlier. We know how to do it. We have found the solutions. We know how to apply them. There is no will to do it in a coordinated, consistent, global way. And that is what they need generation, the next generation will have to find a way to do it. But the yeah. tools of what to do, they, they're already there. And I think, uh, yeah, the story of uh, Dr. Rao, his granddaughter and living in this planet, <laughs> trying to mend it, that's uh, summarizing it. What's, what's the whole struggle is about. Yeah. Well, I think I think we can we have reached uh, a, a good ending of the two analyses and reflections of these two articles, which they were always written for with the purpose of making people think, uh, and I think we done that, uh, and and I think people might be thinking after listening to this conversation. So I think it was excellent as a first trial for this conversation. Thanks very much for your insights and your uh, uh, understanding of the issues. I know you would. But uh, I, yeah, you didn't disappoint. We really managed to dig deeper into into the issues. I think that was very good. Well, thanks, thanks very much. And I hope perhaps we're going to do do that again sometimes in the future with other articles. I would love to. I love your writing. Thank you very much for writing the uh, both pieces and giving us the raw material for today. Uh, it was great to reread them again, and um, yeah, a real privilege to discuss them with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I uh, will stop here. And uh, I hope uh, in the next month, we're going to have another one of these with uh, 
uh, another guest that will choose two of the articles that have been published in Vegan FTA in December 2022. Okay, thank you very much. Bye.